all right ladies and gentlemen welcome back to exotic astrology and today i'm again delighted once again to have vic dikara with us on this channel thank you very thank much you. for coming to exotic astrology welcome and my pleasure today, and today he is going to share with us secrets on this compatibility topic yes many people keep asking oh i am compatible with that person but why is my marriage not working or what is the problem <laughs> Okay, so I have listed some questions to ask. So I would start with them. So the first thing is pre-compatibility. As people are talking about it these days, that what factors do you see, uh, which by which you decide that should you go ahead for for matching the compatibility between two charts? So that would be the the first question. So in other words, you mean that people are looking for a compatibility reading to know whether or not they should get a compatibility reading? Uh, yes. So before pre-compatibility reading. <laughs> wow. The astrologers really have invented some good marketing techniques, haven't they? <laughs> Come and get a, an astrology reading to see if you need an astrology reading. <laughs> People do that also. Please tell me when is the right time to get a reading. <laughs> yeah. Get a mahurta for your pre-astrology reading. <laughs> no, I've never heard of pre pre um compatibility readings before. I don't see any need for them. But you know what I would say is to keep the compatibility astrological compatibility, put it in perspective. I feel that especially with Indian with Indian culture it's gone out of perspective. Mm -hmm. Um the importance assigned to astrological compatibility is unnecessary the amount of importance okay all right did you did parvati have a astrological consultation before she married shiva i don't know maybe not <laughs> no you no, definitely not actually yes you can read in bhagavad purana in the fourth division she didn't uh, you can look look in any purana to see any famous marriage see if anybody consulted an astrologer mm -hmm. Nobody did. They would consult with um, people, you know. They okay. would ask people, but they wouldn't. They weren't. They would find out like who's a good guy, you know. Uh, what are the qualities of this person? What are the qualities of that person? Oh yeah, I like that guy. And then they would, then they would tell their parents what they were interested, who they were interested in, and oh. generally the parent would arrange it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the parent would protest. Oh. If they thought it was a bad choice. That's what happened with Parvati. Okay. Uh, Parvati chose Shiva and her dad didn't like it. Her father was Daksha. Mm -hmm. Her father didn't like it because the Shiva is just a, 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 like a um, yogi. He doesn't have a house. Yes, yes. He doesn't even own a house. So, Whereas Daksha was very upper class. He's super upper class. He's the top Vedic Prajapati. Yeah. Big palace, big, big, fancy life. So here's his princess daughter. He doesn't want her to marry a guy who lives under a tree, right? So he was very against it. Yes, yes. But she went ahead with it anyway. And uh, they got married, but then they caused a lot of problems later because the, the father and, and uh, husband... The husband and the father-in-law got into a lot of conflict, not from Shiva's side, but from Daksha's side. Yes, yes. And then this caused a big problem where she actually committed suicide because she didn't want to be connected with her father anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this, what I was asking in this area was on those lines that say, suppose uh, we suppose there's a girl and she is matching the chart with somebody, but that person is a terrorist or a rapist or a <laughs> But then suppose well, you thing. have a perfect compatibility, but that doesn't mean you marry the person. So before going into the compatibility, you need to check certain things in the chart. So on those lines, what do you think? Yeah, you should check first of all, do I like this person? Okay. Does this person appeal to me? Do I like the way they look? Do I like the way they smell? Do I like the way they talk? Do I like the way they think? Okay. Do it, whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. If you don't naturally feel an interest in the person, then regardless what your compatibility is, like that's your pre-compatibility check is do you like are you interested in this person don't just go and do random compatibility checks with anybody that answers your ad 
you know. Okay. Meet people. You're going to be doing, this is a personal thing. It's not yeah. just to be done through these advertisements and stuff, matrimonials and all that. That's a very bad idea for a marriage. Yes, yes. Go and meet people. See who you actually like. Then that's your pre-compatibility. Okay. Then if you, if you have faith in astrology, then check, with, then check with the astrologer. Should this be done? Okay. You know, am I right about this person? Or, see, now that brings up another question, which may be on your list. What is astrological compatibility actually about? Mm -hmm. That's the next question. <laughs> yeah, what was it? How did you word it? Yeah, it is that only. How do you approach this topic? I mean, once you yeah. decide that I have cleared the pre-compatibility round, then <laughs> how it starts. Yeah, so what, uh, what astrological compatibility about? Think about the word compatibility. It doesn't necessarily mean awesomeness. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it means compatibility. Like you could put two terrorists together or something, or you could put two people with awful marriage karma together. Oh. They may be very compatible. Or you could put two people. See, comp so what is compatibility? Then compatibility is the magnetism. Okay. Between two two people, it, it's the forces that make a relationship compelling. Where oh. it would be, you, it would be hard for you to get out of that relationship. That's what compatibility is. Okay. Like if you put somebody's moon across from my moon. And it's easy for me to get into a relationship with that person and hard for me to get out from it if they're 180 degrees apart. Oh, okay. I see. Because we have strong compatibility. So it, the relationship between the two of us is compelling. Okay. Whether that's good or bad, usually it's good. Okay. Because how, you know, a relationship requires commitment and long-term and a relationship requires that when there's bumps in the road, you don't just hit hit the road you don't just jump out of the relationship when things become difficult you have to be committed enough to the relationship to try to work it out so compatibility is very really helpful for that because it holds the relationship together but i've seen many cases i would even say 70 uh 30 percent 30 percent of the cases where there's strong compatibility it's actually a, a bad relationship okay but that the person the person can't get out of it because of the strong magnetism and the compatibility. They're so oh. compelled to stay with that person. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, this is like going by regular compatibility techniques. Mm -hmm. There's other things you can do to try to figure out whether or not this is going to be a good, a good relationship that I'm that I stick into, or is it a better relationship that I'm stuck in? Okay. But that's one thing that people should know is just getting a compatibility score just shows how much stickiness there is between the people, how much magnetism there is between the people. If you have a high compatibility score, usually, especially by the Western method, okay, then it, it, it really means it's just boom, you just stick together. Yeah. What, what do you mean this Western method? Right. Well, so there's Eastern and there's Indian and Western methods of compatibility. Um, I think one of your questions was about Gun, yeah. Gun Milan, and yeah. so like Gun Milan or the Kuta system has various names. That's the Indian system. It's a, it's a actually a simp In one sense, it's a very simple system. Yes. But in one sense, it's really wonderful. The reason why it's very simple is because it just takes the moon. Oh. You just care about the moon. Throw out the rest of the charts, the rest of the plans. That's very useful because. Astrology has been practiced for a long time and it hasn't always been easy for people to just type their birth data into a website and get their chart. You know, 10 years ago, you couldn't even do that. Right. So it's very useful in an age where people only know their, their nakshatra. Oh, okay. You know, so if, if you just know your nakshatra and I know my nakshatra, we can see what our compatibility is. Oh, okay. So it's a very simple thing. All you need to know is what, what, what your nakshatra's moon is, your moon's nakshatra. Mm -hmm. so that's useful. And then the reason why it's fabulous, the reason why it's wonderful is even though it's just taking this one factor of the moon, it's analyzing that in so many interesting ways. Oh. I think um, seven, there's seven or eight categories, yes. basic categories, that 
that analyzes the various aspects of what relationships involve, like how productive are the people together, how much do they have the same kind of temperament or a different kind of temperament, like a bit different basic way of going about life, how much are they physically attracted to each other, stuff like that. It takes in a lot of considerations just based on these nakshatras. So it's pretty amazing. That's a pretty amazing technique for getting lots of information out of one simple thing. Okay, okay. That's the Indian system. The Western system is more complex, right? Because it's more recently developed. It's de developed in a time where charts are more easily accessible. Mm -hmm. um, this may have also been active in India at some point, but they favored the nakshatra system, I think, just because it's easier to do. And then the Western system would also be actually, there's a simple version and there's a pro version of it. The simple version of the Western system is almost the same as the simple version of the Indian system, but it's just based on the sun. Like someone would say, what's your sign? This is the classic thing in America. You go to a bar, you want to get, you want to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you go to a bar, you go up to the cutest looking one around and you say, what's your sign? It's like a classic joke, right? Classic pickup line is what's your sign? And then they'll tell you, oh, I'm a Leo because she's born in Je July and August. Okay. Right? okay. And then the guy thinks, oh, you're a Leo. No, I'm an Aquarius. Oh, that's going to work. Or whatever, whatever he knows about astrology, he'll think, oh, you're a Leo. I'm an Aries. That's great. We're both fire signs. Hey, baby. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's your, that's your simplified Western approach. Okay. But think about the, um, the basic principle there is it's, it's very elemental based. If you're in the same element trying as me, mm -hmm. then we're going to get along great. Okay. Like if you're a fire sign and I'm a fire sign, we're going to get along great. If you're in a compatible element with me, then we'll also get along good. Like if you're fire and I'm air or vice versa, or if you're earth and I'm water. Seven houses. Seven or 311. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So if it's, if it's a, the same element or a compatible element, it'll be wonderful. And what if the ascendant lords are similar? Like if somebody has moon in Pisces and Sagittarius, then then that is not. But both are the tattva is different. One is fire, water. The, from the ascendant lord. No, I mean whatever system you said, like you said, yeah. that three eleven or the same tattva is good. So I'm saying that if the uh, the ruler is same for both their moon sign or something, like. Yeah, well, that wouldn't be a simplified Western system at all. But you you can take apply the same simple thing about the Western system to that. So, yeah, I'm say, asking on those simple lines only. Like just now, you said if it is three eleven, then it is good. Or if it yeah. is one five nine, it is good. So I'm asking, suppose for Pisces and Sag, and for Aries and Scorpio, the rulers are same. So on those lines, what would you say? Because they have the same ruler, but they yeah. have bad. The bad tattva combinations? Different tattvas like water, fire, yeah. but the ruler is same. So what we would say that that it's not a good it's not a good combination. Oh okay. <laughs> okay. But you'll have gra graha maitri, right? Then you have if you then if you go to the Indian, you got yeah. there's different ways of analyzing it. If you look at it from Indian system, then you have Graha Maitri, which means their friendship between the planetary lords of the planetary lords are the same. Oh okay. So this the other thing with astrology is you don't just have a yes or a no answer. Okay. You have a, you have black and you have white and then you have all the shades in between. So, and the way that you're adding things up is also complex. It's not just it's not just like a rhythm, arithmetic addition to get. Uh, okay. So you say like, okay, these guys both have the same planetary ruler, so that's a one that's a good point. Yes. But they have incompatible elements. Mm-hmm. That's a bad point. So you have to put both of those things into the same lens and see them both at the same time. And you don't just do a straight subtraction. You know, it's not just like one point plus one plus four, so it equals uh, plus, plus one minus two, so it equals minus one. It's mm. not as simple as that. It's the like... Because like, we need to consider. Yeah, it's like multiplication of by the powers of 10 or something. You know, it's the things get cubed and squared and everything instead of just straight arithmetic. Um, so it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. But to explain this, the basics, what you would do 
in the, the Western system is use this elemental analysis for mainly for the, the moon, just like Indian system is mainly the moon, mainly the moon and then also the ascendant and Venus and the sun. And each one will show you a different angle. And then you do all, you get all kinds of complicated after that by putting them all together. Yeah, so that only I wanted to ask, like, uh, what do you say nowadays? They say that in many places that you must check the ascendant lords, uh, then you should go to the moon. For example, if the ascendant lord, somebody is a Leo and somebody is an Aquarius or, or somebody is a Libra, then the ascendant lords are not friends. So then uh, they say that that is important even if the moon is matching in trines or something because ascendant will show how physically the karma is manifesting. Yeah. So there's so many things. See, that's a good, that's a good principle. But now the real problem or the challenge where you get to the point where the, just the casual um, hobbyist of astrology can't really enter is how do you put all these things together? No. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. If, if I just said, if I just say, yeah, check your first, check your ascendant lords. If they're friends, you guys are great. If they're not friends, don't get married. Then everybody watching the video can turn off the video and go do that and be happy. Yes, they can go to sleep. Right. But where I can't, where they can't get in is if I say, but you also have to see if your elements are together. Okay. Right. Because then sometimes they're going to say, well, like you just point up, like the point you just brought up, well, my ascendant lords are not compatible, but my tattvas are compatible. What now? And then what about the fact that I also have the moon, my moon tattvas with this person that I'm interested in are compatible, but my sons are not. Oh. So the, the, the thing of being a master or genius or good astrologer is to be able to juggle all those things and then the, the hallmark of a, of a dabbler or a hobbyist is they can only go one at a time they can only think of each thing in isolation but a real a real a genius astrologer a good astrologer will be able to synthesize all those things into one picture okay and the another reason, I guess, for this, uh, they said that the uh, sign should not be same because they said that the key, because then the transits will always be the same. So if suppose uh, for you, it is transiting in the eighth house, if a slow moving planet, then for the other person also, it will transit in the same house. So then that will create a big challenge. So, Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that, that in principle, because that's as far as the way I learned compatibility astrology and also what makes sense to me. One of the principles is if, if people have similar karma, then they marry well. Okay. But if they have dissimilar karma, how is it that they can be married? They can't be married. It won't even like Yama can't allow that because how can Yama give you a, a million dollars? But if I'm oh. your wife, how can, and I'm destined to be poor, but uh -huh. you got a million dollars. How can, he can't let that happen, right? You can't okay. do that. Yeah. So you want to see for to to have trust that these people these people can actually get married and they can stay married. No. They have to have a lot of similarity in, oh. uh, in a lot of things about their karma. Okay. Like if one of them is supposed to be fabulously rich and the other one is not. Uh. How do they? How does that work if they get married? So if they're having similar transits, then that's probably a good sign. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Like similar things would be happening to, to them at the same time, which is quite likely if they're living in the same house. Okay. Which is what usually happens when you get married. Oh. In terms of uh, analyzing the tattvas and the, the geometrical shapes between things, if you have the same sign, it's about a 90% positivity. To have the opposite sign is 100%. To have the same sign is a little less. So it's, it's actually quite good to have the same side because you see things the same way. Okay, okay. But it, sometimes you'll step on each other's toes because you're too much the same. It's not totally <laughs> yeah. Now, don't forget, these are all super simple, sim simplified explanations. Like within each sign, there's a navamsha and so many other amshas. So, I mean, 
do you have exactly the same sign as me? Probably not, unless you have exactly oh. three degrees. Oh, okay. Right. So then, uh, when when it comes to the matching of signs and whatever you call it, I mean, so then, do you give more weightage to the lagna chart or the navamsha for both? It, all of the synastry things that we do are done from the from the lagna. Yes, from from the lagna major. or navamsha. That's what I'm asking. Oh, from the it's lagna. All, it is. Well, from lagna, because you can't do. You could theoretically do synastry of the navamsha. Okay, but. It's sort of it. It kind of defies logic to do it that way because what you're doing because what what is the difference between a navamsha and a a lagna chart? The lagna chart is the real picture of the sky. Yes. The navamsha chart is a hypothetical thing. Any okay. any amsha chart is a hypo. It's a theory. It's not a theory. It's a it's a hypothetical depiction of real stuff. How can I explain this? Like, way. yeah, like actually, what the Navamsha is showing is the geometrical relationship. Like, let's say if I if I have Sun and Mars in the same Navamsha, okay, they may be separated by a great deal of space, but they might wind up in the same Navamsha sign. Correct, correct, right? But there, the amount of space that they have to be separated by to wind up in the same Navamsha sign is particular. It's like okay. sixty degrees or something, or forty-five degrees. I forget. But it's a specific amount of distance. And the same thing if it's for a different Amsha chart. The, what the Amsha chart is showing you is something that's, the word is implicit. It's not hypothetical, but implicit. The Amsha charts are implicit in the reality, but they're not the reality itself. Okay, yes. So when you're doing a synastry, you want to compare, <clears throat> you want to compare your chart with my chart. I don't really think it would be so great to, Go and compare the Navamshas. It's, all, it's already complicated enough. Like, why would we go to the Navamshas? But what I would do is, what, see, what, what, I, what I offer is I offer two kinds of consultations for compatibility. One is real simple. You just get a compatibility report. Okay. And, and the report analyzes the moon and the Laguna Milan and all that stuff, and it analyzes the, all those shapes and tattva things that I was talking about, and it does the Kuja Dosha thing. And it just okay. tells you these numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's just going to, and that chart report is going to show you the stickiness. Mostly, mostly it's going to show you the co compellingness of the relationship, how well you stick together. Okay, okay. But then the second option that I have is let's do an actual reading, right? I'm going to act, I'll actually look at your chart, think about how, what it says about you and your marriage, and look at the person, the perspective partner's chart what does it say about that person's marriage and, and nature? Think about how they match. Think about all kinds of things like Navamsha's. Think about all kinds of things like Shashchamsa's. Think about all kinds of things. Put them all together and, and then put that in with the compatibility score. Okay. To get, a, to, get a really, to get a really trustworthy picture of the compatibility, you have to do it that way. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so that... that brings to the uh, next question that uh, regarding this uh, moon venus thing so <laughs> this uh, they do the matching for venus also what do you think i mean do you take that also into consideration yeah well so like i like i said earlier um the traditional indian system is just the moon okay but it's analyzing many things about the moon and because the moon is your mind yes it's basically holding all the other planets anyway. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, okay. It has an aspect. It, it has the facet of Venus and Mars and everything in it because that's what the mind is. So it's, it's reasonable to just analyze the moon and you can analyze all kinds of things about the moon. But it's like saying that you don't need any of the subcharts. If you just look at the moon, you don't need to look at any other planet. That's okay. That, that's like saying, well, you just need to look at the main chart. You don't need umptious. Okay. You have these umptions, why not look at them? Similarly, we have these other planets, why not look at them? Okay. Venus is very important for romantic relationships. Okay. So if you're not checking the compatibility between the two people, the, the, the Venuses of the partners, yeah. you're really, it's, 
a dangerous thing to do if you're going to you know come to a conclusion about how compatible they are for a romantic relationship if it's some other kind of relationship you don't need to check venus i want to check mercury or jupiter oh. or something Okay. If it's a business relationship, maybe it's Mercury. If it's a like a learning relationship, a student relationship, it's Jupiter would take the place of Venus. Oh, okay. But if it's a marriage relationship and you don't check Venus, I think that's kind of alarming. You need to check okay. So you would just do the same thing with Venus. Like what's the what's the element of your Venus? Right? Oh, the you have a Venus that's in a Taurus, so it's an earthy element. And that mine is in Libra. It's an air element that doesn't get along so well. That's the basic first step. Well, how, how exact is that alignment? Is your Venus at 15 degrees of Taurus and mine is at 15 degrees of Aries, of, of Libra? And that's like exact when they really don't get along too well. You know, the more exact the alignment is, the more that Tattva thing becomes prominent. The more unexact it is, the more unimportant the Tattva consideration is. Okay. And then you want to see not only does how does your Venus affect my Venus, but also what about what's the relationship between your Venus and my sun, your Venus and my moon, your Venus and my ascendant. That's the full picture. Yeah. So how do you delineate that? I mean, moon and sun. Uh, so, sorry, Venus and sun or Venus and moon. So You know what I could do? I just got an idea to do this. I can show you okay. a compatibility report. Okay, fantastic. I'll share, share, I can share a screen, right? Yes. Why don't I show you a compatibility report? Let's see who I have saved. I'm thinking about myself and my wife, but maybe that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> Let me see if I have Krishna. I may have Krishna and Radha on here. Okay. I have Krishna and Das, but I think I have a Krishna. Here, oh, no, no. Somehow. Let me see if I have Radha. If I have Radha, see I have, oh, well, somebody might be named Radha. Let me see what this is. Radha Rani. Now this is somebody from New Zealand. Okay, so I think I'm going to have to show you um, my, me and my wife. Or maybe just me and a random person, but no, I'll, I'll do my way. Okay, so let me share this screen. Right, so this is a basic chart. It's just, I don't really typically do a square chart, but it's really easy to show it this way. So you got two charts overlaid onto one. Okay. And that's what, that's the basis of what you're analyzing is how these two charts flip together. Oh. So the red, the red planets are my wife's and the blue planets are mine. Oh, okay. Right, so a couple of things will catch your eye. Like here's a Mars moon conjunction between the two of us. Okay. Or here's a, like um, K2 sun conjunction because her my K2 is three degrees Virgo and hers, her sun is two degrees. Uh -huh. Venus is pretty close. Venus and Mercury, they're pretty closely conjoined. These kind of things will catch your eye. Saturn, K2. Oh, okay. You might look for... I mean, these kind of things should catch your eye too, like the opposites. Oh, okay. The are opposite. The Jupiters are opposite. Okay. Right. That's the basis of, of um, that. this is the chart that you use for a synastry chart. You put two charts together in one. And I don't really prefer it in a square. Like I said, I, I like it better in a circle. So you can actually see, see, it's easier to see things. But I haven't updated this in many years so it's still with this old older style i'll update it soon okay <laughs> look at our chart see this is important right my wife and i have been married for 21 years oh okay and told i love her she loves me we have a great relationship we have three kids look at our compatibility score okay so what does that mean it just means that uh it's not it's easy it's easy to break apart Okay. It doesn't mean we will break apart, but it means it's easy to break apart. Or, e or it's not so easy to unify. Okay. Right? So let me tell you something about the numbers too. Now you can see 40. It's not 40 out of 100. 
it's 40 out of 50. If you get a 50% score, then that's a great, that's a normal marriage. 40 out of 50, you mean? I didn't understand this. You see, this is as a final total compatibility is 40%. Okay. So you might think, well, man, that's missing 60%. Okay. But that's what this whole thing over here, read me first, read this first. <laughs> it explains what the scores are all about. You, you got to, av the average is 50. So you want to oh, try to shoot for right. average because okay. average marriages should work, right? Oh, okay. So anything over 50 starts to be better than average and anything under 50 starts to get less than average. So 40 is kind of low, but it's not so low that it's impossible. Okay. If you're getting in 30s, then it's like, this is pretty close to impossible. Oh, okay. Now look at what we have here. It's broken into two segments. Mm -hmm. There's a modern, the modern way of doing the... Um, compatibility assessment and the traditional way of doing it. So this traditional way is Guna Milan. And the modern way of doing it is those tattvas and things that I was talking about between, between oh. the two. Okay, okay. So what you can see is as far as, as far as a traditional marriage goes, it's not so good for that. And in fact, okay. and in fact, the way, that I, the way that we relate is practically a lot of the roles are reversed. Like a lot of the way that the male-female dynamic usually works is reversed in my relationship with my wife. Not every way. Okay. Like I, I earn money and stuff like that and she, she's a housewife. Uh -huh. So on that practical level, it's like a traditional male-female thing. Mm -hmm. But with a lot of the other things, like the way we take care of the kids, the way we relate to each other, it's flipped. So that you would get a, a low compatibility. A lot of the compatibility assessment that comes from the nakshatra matching is to see how the male energy works with the female energy. Ah, uh, okay. And with us, it's backwards, so a lot of that goes down. Okay. And this is the other thing, too. you got to think about compatibility in terms of culture and, uh. and history and time. This the Kuta score, the Kuta matching thing is specific to a certain culture, which is kind of moving. It's kind of becoming outdated a little bit. Yes. Which is where, you, you know, everybody does the thing the same way. And if you don't do it this way, it's not going to work because society is so... In, everybody's so integrated now so everybody's so broken out in society into their own little houses yes you can have something that's very untraditional it can work fine okay but now let's let's break down this ma modern compatibility score how does it get to be 47 so it's got these four aspects to it oh the relationship between the ascendants the relationship between the moon the relationship between the suns and the relationships between the venus uh-huh and so there's individual scores for each one telling you more about the, each one is more on a certain topic, like the ascendant compatibility is more about practical things. The moon compatibility is about emotional things. The sun compatibility is like ideology and identity. Okay. And Venus is about how you relax and enjoy and have fun. Uh, okay. So now if we look at why do I have like a 51% score for the ascendant? So the, the base score is what we talked about before. It's, I have a 77% base score. Okay. With her. So why? Why is that? Well, if you go back up and you look at the ascendants, my mm -hmm. ascendants, Capricorn, hers is Cancer. So oh. That's Earth and water, right? Oh, oh, oh. So that should actually be 100%. Yes. But her ascendant is 11 degrees and mine is 25 degrees. So they're not perfectly aligned. So oh. it's a portion of that 100%. Compatibility, oh, okay, but it's a it still winds up being a great compatibility. Yes, yes, okay. Then you modify that. That's your, that's just your starting point. Now you want to modify it by the other ones. You know, how about her moon, sun, and Venus to my ascendant? Oh. Or how about my moon, sun, and Venus to her ascendant? That's what these bars are talking about. Oh, okay. so there's a really low one here, and this okay. this this really helps you zo um, zero in on what is the actual trick in the relationship. Like, oh. like if somebody just says, Oh, you have 17 out of 32 points, go ahead and get married. It doesn't really tell you anything about what your marriage is going to be like. Okay. Or, you know, where, where are the weak points? But what this thing is saying is, okay, there's a, this is looking really rosy. Everything looks great. You guys get along really good. There's one, there's one weak point here. Okay which is 
between her moon or emotions and my pract and my ascendant or practical life. Oh. So there's a clash between that. Okay. So I'm going to have to watch out if I want to make this relationship work. See, also what the astrology is doing, astrology is not fatalistic. It's not saying, hey, this marriage cannot work. This marriage can work. It's saying this is what this marriage is like. If you want it to work, you've got to make it work by working with what it's like. Oh, okay. No? Like if I deal you a bunch of cards, if we're playing cards and I deal you a bunch of cards, it doesn't, and you get no, you don't have nothing special in your hand. We that do doesn't mean that you lose else. the game. Now you have to learn how to play. How do I play with these cards? Yeah. So in these regards, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, how how do you think this manifests? I mean, this twelve percent. Yeah. So I would have I would have to be very careful about how my practical daily life. Like, for example, I love if if I wasn't married to my wife, I would wake up at like three in the morning. Okay. You know, and go to sleep at like eight. Okay. And I would like have the schedule every single day where just, tick, 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 you know, like I'm super Capricorn moon in the sixth house, all that okay. kind of very regimented stuff. Okay. My wife is not like that at all. So if, if I stick to my practical schedules, mm -hmm. we'll have very little time together. And okay. we'll have very little interaction with each other and she'll feel lonely. Oh, so what I have to do to make the marriage work easier, work better, is not be that person who wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and you know does my everything on a schedule. Although you can't entirely not be yourself, but yes, you have to take care of that aspect. Yeah. So what th this helps me see this is where I need to change a little bit to make this relationship work better. Otherwise, she's gonna feel moony. Moony means moody, alone, emotional. But if I spend more time with her, she'll feel great. It'll, it'll alleviate this 12% thing. Oh, okay. And if you alleviate that 12% thing, you know, then that, this 12% thing is really kicking it down. <laughs> and then here's another one. You, her Saturn to my ascendant is also very bad. Okay. <laughs> but her my jupiter to her ascendant is very good okay so this is also very easy to explain because i i i'm living this chart but you know um 